Right, so I, uh, I'm, I'm an entomologist, but uh, also thinking about where insects fit, and I tend to approach entomology from a different standpoint, um, where we're looking at, at promoting insects, and I'll tell you why. Um, right, I'm also a farmer, I'm also a beekeeper. Um, so four years and four summers ago, uh, we started a regenerative farm in eastern South Dakota because I think we need to change how agricultural science is conducted. Uh, scientists need to have first-hand experience with farming systems. It, it increases the relevance of the kinds of questions that we're asking. <clears throat> um, so on our own operation, honey is the big, um, is the big uh, money maker. Uh, and then we have uh, sheep production, hair sheep for uh, meat production and, and uh, vegetation management. We have a layer operation for local pastured eggs, um, pastured uh, broilers, and then uh, an orchard is in there. It, it's a pretty diversified system, some annual crop production as well. Anyways, <clears throat> so yes, uh, I'm not just going to be talking and, and preaching at you as far as how you should be managing your farm. I've been there. I uh, made a lot of mistakes myself, so uh, without further ado, a lot of these ideas, all right, it's beeping at me, all right, so I can just use this maybe, how the hell do you want to I can just use the clicker, or the, I'm sorry, this thing, now it's working? Okay, good. Right, good. Um, so, beginning of January, uh, I was asked to speak before the, the National Beekeepers meeting. They had the keynoting down there near, near Chicago. And it was, uh, I kind of, I asked them, you know, how long have your bees been dying? Uh, they are like, oh, 2006, 2008. You know, that kinda, that's kind of when the bees really started to crash nationally. And I said, well, um, okay, well, how, many, how, how much money have you spent on um, research to save the bees? And they're like, oh, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. And they're like, okay, how, how, how'd your bees do last year? The room got real quiet. They, uh, because this isn't a bee problem, right? Um, but we're treating it as though it is. This is much bigger than a bee problem. And every state in the country ended up hiring on another bee scientist to solve the bee problem, right? Like, how's that working? It's not. Because, yeah, we've learned a heck of a lot more about, you know, honeybees and their biology and stuff like that, but it's not solving the problem. It's the same situation in agricultural science in general, right? I mean, we spend hundreds of millions a year on fixing all of the issues that you guys are confronting in agriculture and crop production and beef production. Margins get thinner every year, right? People are making less and less money, at least the farmers are. It's broken. <clears throat> this isn't a bee problem. This is a biodiversity problem. We're not just losing bees, we're losing entire habitats, right? We're draining the wetlands, we're putting it into the Mississippi and sending it down to the Gulf. Where'd the prairie go? Entire insect communities are dying right now. Uh, it's called the insect apocalypse. We've lost 60% of insect biomass in the last 27 years. The windshield test, uh, when you guys were growing up, how often did you have to clean the windshield when you were driving around the county? And how often do you have to do it now, right? We're losing birds, we're losing bats, we're losing bees, we're losing butterflies at a rate of extinction that the planet has never experienced before. This is the worst mass extinction event that Earth has ever experienced. Worse than the dinosaurs, okay? What's the problem? It isn't soybeans. It's how we're producing soybeans. Our farms have become an asteroid hitting planet Earth. 
but it's also the solution, okay? It's also the solution. Agriculture, food production is not the problem. It's how we're producing it. Agriculture has become far too simplified. <coughs> what does that mean? What that means is we've eliminated life from our farms. <laughs> Biodiversity. Life is microbes, fungi, uh, worms, nematodes, insects, plants, birds, critters, right? That is biodiversity. Biodiversity is good not because we love species, right? Biodiversity in life is good because it does things. It drives the productivity of your farm. And when you eliminate the life from your farm, you have to replace it with a jug. Okay? And the more jugs you use, the more jugs you need. It doesn't matter what's on the side of the jug. It can say nitrogen. It can say herbicide. It can say uh, insecticide, fungicide, whatever, right? It's all jugs, and it's all meant to replace the life on your farm and what it did for you for free. All right? It's an addiction. And who wins in an addiction scenario? It's not the addict. It's the people pushing the drugs. There's a lot of money being made on farming right now. A lot of money is being made on farming right now. But it's not by the farmers. Let's put the money back where it belongs. Life. Um, right, so the vast majority of life on your farm is stuff you can't see. It lives in the soil. Right? This is what we're talking about here. All different kinds. Bacteria, protozoa that are eating the bacteria, nematodes that are eating the protozoa and the bacteria, mites that are eating all of this stuff. Springtails, little columbola that have a furcula on their buds. They actually use that thing to launch themselves off. And you'll see this happening. It's a lot of fun. I kind of wish I had that every once in a while. When the boss walks in, you know, you can boing, there you go. <laughs> Uh, insects, we've got a lot, this is what I really like, these are, this is the, now we're getting into biodiversity that you can actually see, right? The critters up here. All the way up to vertebrates, things with backbones. In one square meter of soil, the amount of life is really staggering that's in your soil. Um, I did one estimate uh, out on Dakota Lakes Research Farm, uh, Dwayne Beck's place, <laughs> He had a billion just predatory insects per acre in the soil. And it's a lot of work to quantify those things. Right? That's why we don't have a lot of information on just how much life there is. It's because it's a royal pain in the neck trying to get estimates on how much life there is. <clears throat> Oops. Um, but we are doing these bio-inventories, right? Bio-inventories is counting the number of species that live on a farm. Remarkably, for as much work as we have spent um, researching farmland and different crops and different livestock systems, we know very little about the life that lives there. So we are trying to remedy that, okay? We are conducting these bio-inventories all over the country. Try, and, and it's not something that's sexy that you get a grant for, right? This is stuff, but yet it's fundamental science that we need. How do we know how our, how our management practices or how our planetary change is affecting life if we don't even know what's living there, right? So we've done these inventories. There's 482 species that live in corn. This is just insects that we counted in eastern South Dakota. Wheat, 103 species of predators, only predatory insects. 126 species of predators. In cow poop, in cow crap, in eastern South Dakota, we have identified 172 species of insects that live there. That's more than what we're finding in soybean fields, for crying out loud. A lot of work. A lot of work goes into these. I, we're, now we're trying to optimize how to do these things in the lab because we're just being overwhelmed. How do you understand all of that life? How that, and the implications that that life has for the, uh, the productivity of your farm. 
It becomes very complicated very quickly. And so we turned to the, the social literature in order to try to understand um, this stuff. Network theory, um, this is how you know, search engines figure out you know, what advertisement to, to throw up on your web pages when you're searching around. Who's connected to who? Who, who would be your good friend under certain circumstances, right? And so we turn to the statistical underpinnings of social sociology in order to try to understand how bio biological networks work. Much of our biological networks, uh, one network that you guys might be really familiar with is food webs, right? You learn about these in school. You know, how, you know one, in, uh, one, one organism eats another organism eats another organism. And those connections then form a network. It forms a web, right? Don't worry, I'm going to get into why this is important by the time that we're all finished. So, okay, so much of our understanding of these networks comes from very simplified systems. Within science, we take a black plastic pot, we throw a corn plant in there, we put an herbivore on there. Maybe it's the European corn borer or the corn rootworm and then, or an aphid. And then we put like a lady beetle in there and we got it all caged up and we say, oh, you know, when we do this, then we reduce the pest or when the pest goes crazy, all this good stuff. But this ignores the, the complexity of the natural world. So this is an actual network from cornfields. This was a royal pain in the neck to generate, okay? This was like 53 cornfields. We did complete bio-inventories. We counted all of the insects that were living in these cornfields. We dissected plants in each of these fields and counted them up, right? It's a hairball. Right? So when there was like numerical associations between these two species, we would draw a line, right? So statistically, across all of these fields, this is what ends up coming out of it. So, okay, take a step back. Now, number 80, number 80s are pests. So you're allowed to hate number 80 over here. This is the bad guy, right? All of our efforts need to be focused on species number 80. We're gonna, we're gonna spend hundreds of dollars per acre in controlling that species and ignore everything else that's living in that corner. <laughs> but by doing that, you already lost. You already lost the game because species 80 was never the problem. Species 80 is generated, the abundance of this pest is generated by all of these interactions. Each dot is a cornfield, okay? This is species diversity in each of these cornfields, and this is how many pests there are. Cornfields that have a lot of pests do not have species diversity. There's no life in them, okay? That's important. This is community evenness. What this is, is it's a measure, it's an ecological measure of like how abundant everything is, okay? All of those species and all of these cornfields. So are they all of equal abundance or is there some of them that are going crazy and some of them that are just singletons, right? They're just a couple of loners out there. Even communities don't have pests. We're producing our pests through our management decisions. How do you encourage insect diversity in your fields? Plant diversity. Plants. How else? How do you reduce diversity of insects in your fields? Chemicals. Buy a jug. Doesn't matter what's on the side of the jug. It all does it. It can say organic. It can say, you know, whatever. It's a jug and it reduces diversity, okay? So we are in control of this situation. The diversity and the abundance of every other group of organisms scales directly with how many plant species you have in a habitat. So now you understand why monocultures don't work. They don't work. Remember that hairball? 
I teased out the main components, okay? So this is a this is a the pest abundance, or this is this is the diversity uh, and, and the interaction. This is a network that was present in a cornfield that has very low pest abundance. Look at all the connections that are going on in there, right? All of these species are interacting with each other. This is a cornfield that had the highest pest abundance. It's broken. There's no connections among the species anymore. There's even a pentagram. That's a sign of the devil, right? <laughs> I presented that out in uh, San Francisco, and somebody came. This lady came up afterwards, and she was like, um, "Dr. Lundgren, I was offended at the pentagram joke. I, I'm a witch." And, uh, oh gosh, there's one in every audience. <laughs> Did I work for you at the USDA? <laughs> anyway. So as the connections within that community strengthen, we see that those are the, those are the cornfields that don't have pests. How does this matter? Right? How do you use that information? I mean, that's really basic science, right? But it's telling us something really important. So Claire was one of my master's uh, students, um, and she, she kind of knitted together about a decade of research, maybe 15 years worth of corn entomology research that we were conducting into a single study that just, it, it, in one day, uh, this study um, became, or went to the top 1% of all science ever written in terms of social media impact, which is not bad for a master's program, right? <laughs> what Claire did that was so innovative, she actually works for, in, uh, as, uh, for the University of Minnesota in, uh, near Fairfield now, um, in extension. Uh, so what Claire did that was so wonderful is she said, okay, people are using this information about diversity on their farms, whether they know it or not, they're practicing regenerative farming, okay? And so what she did is in Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota, and Nebraska, we found some of the top regenerative producers of corn. And we said, point us at the corn phase of your rotation. And we went out and we sampled those fields. And then we said, okay, show us your neighbor who's, doing, who's a good conventional farmer, okay? That, that's been profitable and, and all of that stuff. They've been around for a long time. And so they did, and we sampled those fields. So regenerative farms aren't linked necessarily by practices. They're, they're linked by, by, by principles. And I'm sure you guys have heard these. We've been kicking these things around for a while. And we can talk a lot more about that if you guys want to. But there were, in this study, two practices, or one practice that was really really telling about what was going on in these two systems. None of the regenerative cornfields used insecticides, sometimes for decades. All of the conventional cornfields used BT corn, so it was genetically modified to resist insect pests, and it was all treated with neonicotinoid seed treatments, which are about the dumbest thing you could possibly put in your field, by the way. I'll just call that out now. All right. That's a really bad business decision. <laughs> All right. Then we went out and we did full bio inventories. We, we took the corn plants and we sliced them up and we looked inside of the corn plants for any insects. And then we got down on our hands and knees and we, and, we, and we looked on any insects on the soil surface. And then we'd suck them up with these little aspirator devices that we were using. And then we'd take a soil core and we'd drill into the soil and we'd get a soil column. And we'd extract those things, we'd put them into a, we're lazy, I'll show you those in a little bit, and then all of the insects that lived in the soil, we would quantify those too. And then we also looked at the yields, and we looked at the profits of each of these fields around the region. The insecticide-treated cornfields had 10 times more pests. That wasn't supposed to happen, right? Because as an entomologist, I was trained, okay, I'm an entomologist, pests are inevitable. You're going to have them. 
So what you have to do is you have to get down on your hands and knees and you gotta wait. And you gotta watch your feelings, right? And because they're coming. They're coming for you. And then the insects arrive. Oh, oh don't fire away yet! Don't hold off, because that's good entomology as you start counting the insects. You count them up, and then they hit a threshold, and then you act. You buy a jug, and you spray them out, and it's so satisfying to watch them die right in front of your eyes. Right? And what these farmers said, showed me, is that by designing their systems appropriately, they don't have insect pests anymore. Okay? Insects are not, pests are not inevitable. They are an artifact of your decisions. And until you take responsibility for that, you're gonna keep buying jugs and you're gonna keep a lot of big agrochemical companies in pretty good shape. They're gonna love you. Yields were down by 29% in the regenerative uh, cornfields. Profits were twice as high. Why on earth do we give prizes to the farmer that can grow the highest yield in the county? A well-trained monkey can grow 300 bushel corn if they buy enough junk and put it out there. It's about the profits. Right? Isn't it? Yes. yes. Why were these guys twice as profitable? Significantly reduced their seed costs significantly reduced their fertilizer costs, and they marketed their product. Some of them just sold it down to the coop, and that was fine. Very few of these were organic, by the way. They weren't getting a premium. They were getting a premium because they were working within their own communities in some ways. They were planting non-GMOs, which is, GMOs has locked you guys into a pretty rotten situation, uh, and getting off of that is pretty critical in order for us to move forward. Can't sell your seed, you can't keep your seed, can't grow anything else. Um, so that's why, right? We asked, or we looked at the data, and we said, this idea that high yields are what we're after, right? If we just get that next three bushels, we're good farmers, right? And we looked at that, and we said, our yields correlated with profits in these cornfields. They weren't. You want to know what the profits were correlated with? Each dot is a cornfield here. The amount of soil organic matter these farmers had generated. The more soil organic matter they had generated on their farm, the more profitable they were. That's what we need to be giving prizes for. Mm -hmm. Not profit. No, I'm sorry, not yields on soil. You guys were all waiting for it. When's he going to put a turd on the screen? Okay? Wait no more. It's poop time. Dung as habitat. All right. Uh, how many of you guys are livestock producers? Oh, good. Perfect. Uh, 450 species of insects are identified in cattle dung. That was a really that was down in the southwestern U.S. Um, around the world, dung beetles steal the show. Oftentimes in this dialogue, when we think about dung insects, we think dung beetles, don't we? And that may be true, or may be right, and that may be wrong, but it is what it is. We've got about 1,500 species of dung beetles in North America. Many people have called me saying, "I don't have dung beetles on my farm." And I said, well, you would be the one farm that I have ever seen that doesn't. <laughs> they're there. They're, they're not these big African beetles that are rolling around elephant turds, right? <laughs> they're little itty bitty things that are recycling your pets. Out of these insects, this incredible diversity that's associated just with cattle dung, 1.7% of them are pests. Okay. Why is dung removal so important? Entomology, well, let's see if I've got that. Yeah, I got that. Okay, uh, pasture fouling. When there's a turd down there, the, it, there's no grass, right? I mean, there's grass around it, but not in the patch itself. When uh, cattle were first introduced into uh, Australia and New Zealand, 
uh, they, they, th there was nothing to break down the turds. I mean, uh, all of the local dung uh, insect community was adapted to large marsupials who poop in pellets. And so these large cow pats just sat there and languished, right? And what ended up happening is that the pastures were rendered absolutely useless. I mean, they just cracked them up too much. And then, and then suddenly all these flies started to make a living on these pats, okay? And so the, you couldn't walk around. There was flies everywhere on these islands where they had introduced cattle until they introduced dung beetles in order to start in, or breaking these things down. So a lot of these pests are associated with the pats as well. Many of our parasites are associated with the pats. The faster you break those down, the less parasites you have. So dung beetles alone are valued, and we're actually generated, this, this number was generated back in the 1980s. We are currently doing the work on this to value dung beetles in North and South Dakota in, uh, uh, on, on regenerative and conventional ranches right now. So we can see how much of an impact, economic impact, that regenerative uh, cattle management has on their bottom line. So, I mean, we didn't take this turd and throw it in the air and shoot it with a shotgun, right? Those holes, <laughs> those holes are because the insects are penetrating into it, right? So if you see holes in your pads, um, it's, maybe it's the neighbor kid having fun with you, but chances are probably good that you've got pretty good insect communities. They s recycle nutrients, right? This is the life that drives the productivity of your rangeland, your pasture. So we wanted to see what the insects were doing on these things. So we, uh, this was work that was done by Jacob Pachenka. He's a former master's student. He's now getting his doctorate down at uh, Purdue. Um, so we caged up a bunch of turds, okay? So we put these insect-proof cages around them. And then we checked them regularly, and then we would pick up these turds, and then we would weigh them to see how much they had broken down over time. So this is one of the smellier experiments that we've ever run. <laughs> because we didn't just, this is Jacob here, uh, it looks a little frustrated at having to pick up so much poop. Um, but we didn't just collect the poop, we warmed it up. <laughs> so we put, put it into these cylinders, and then we, um, uh, as, the, as the turd uh, heats up, all of the insects that live in it are like, ah, get me out of here! And so they run down this funnel where this <laughs> little collection receptacle down there. So it really allows us to get really accurate uh, information about what kinds of insects are living in, in poop. For this part of the study, this is just the first experiment, he identified 87,000 insects to species level. That's a lot of work, right? It's a lot of work. Out of all of these species, there's more than, a, like 109 species of insects were identified from just eastern South Dakota, right? Only 13 of them were dung beetles. Abundance-wise, yeah, that's like 3% of the total insect community was dung beetles. What we learned about this, because we collected those pats over time, and we looked at how the insects were affecting the pats over time, over the life of the, uh, of the turd, what we found first off is that there's a lot of critters in each of these and that the communities change as the pat ages. This is a really complicated diagram that I'm going to explain. This is early season and late season. What we've discovered is that if the insect community can access that pat within the first day to seven days, no longer than seven days, it breaks down. If you don't have insects that rapidly colonize that poop within the first couple of days of it, Splatting on the ground, you're going to have that turd there for a long time. Okay? And so it's really important our management practices have to reflect that. Okay? So if there's if, if environmental conditions, if you're using avermectins or any insecticide on your animals, most of that comes out in the poop, right? And that stops this process. That means all of your pests, all of your pathogens, Recycle in that rangeland. The fastest that I've seen a pat be destroyed was down in Alabama. In one day, it was gone. 
you have to get them out of your fields, out of your pastures within seven days. Otherwise, you get pest recycling. So that's your target goal, seven days. Um, organic matter, <clears throat> the insects contributed to the degradation. Of, that's what these are saying. <clears throat> so what we are really interested in is where dung beetles kind of fit in this whole di dialogue, right? How important are dung beetles? Because that's the one we always get all the press. They were only about 3% of that community in terms of abundance. So it was a, just a finest sliver of that community. But what were they doing? This is arthropod. This is insect abundance. In the early season and in the late season. And this is how many different dung beetle species were out there. What this is saying is that the abundance of all of the other insects were directly related to how many dung beetle species you have. How fast that pat degrades is directly a result of how many dung beetles that you have. Even though there's not very many of them, how many is important. Why is that the case? This makes it, fundamentally, this is what ecologists would call a keystone species. Mm -hmm. that, they have an, uh, an, uh, that they have a tremendous impact on the life in, your, in a habitat that's uncorrelated with their abundance or whatever. So, so you can have very few of them, but still have a huge impact. Why is that? Because as soon as that pat hits the ground, it forms a skin. And the only insects around that are big enough to punch through that are the dung beetles. They open up highway systems through your turds that allow all of the other insects to go in and colonize and break it down. So that's why dung beetles are important. So they drive dung degradation, that's really important. Um, colonization must happen as soon as it comes out of the animal's bung hole. And then, although it's a minority, these dung beetles are a really important component of that dung insect community. <clears throat> How many of you guys use porons? Or any, treat, treat your animals? Anybody? Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Avermectins are um, a neurotoxin that disrupts cell membranes. This affects uh, not just uh, insects. They are incredibly effective as an amanticide, as an insecticide. And they're applied as porons, you can inject them, you can feed them, um, lots of different approaches to this, right? Okay. They're used on the majority of animals in the US. <clears throat> the problem, is that almost all of it comes out in, in the poop. And so it, and then it, and it stays in your pasture for a very long period of time. Veterinarians oftentimes, I, I, I should be careful, but uh, follow the money. If a veterinarian is advising that you use these, uh, the, the, you use these products, chances are good they're getting a kickback. There's a very good chance of it, okay? Understand this. That's how the industry works. That's how the health industry works. Avermectins kill 98% of the insects found in dung. The more you use, the more you need. What causes pests? We learned this in corn. Lack of diversity. Lack of diversity. Too much disturbance. What are disturbances? Tillage. Tillage is a disturbance. Chemicals. Yep, chemicals. Uh, any jug. Doesn't matter what it says. It's all a disturbance. Okay. Is, is hoof penetration not considered part of that? Hmm. So, uh, this is a very, okay. Hmm. All right. So, <laughs> that is a nuanced question. That is a really important nuanced question. Okay, so, um, okay, so for a long time I said no disturbance, right? No disturbance. We don't want to disturb because everybody's tilling the heck out of their ground, right? And that is, I would rather spray a, a, a tanker of herbicide than till the soil. It has more of an impact on the biology and the productivity of your system than any agrochemical that I can think of, okay? I'm, uh, the science is clear on that. Whether people want to admit that is not, uh, especially within the organic community, that is not something that I get in a lot of trouble for saying that. 
However, and so, yes, square one is we've got to stop tilling the soil. And so disturbance is that, right? And so I, I, I say stop, make it as simple as possible. Stop disturbing. Then I was talking with some, we, are, we have regular discussion groups, both with farmers and with, within our own lab team at, uh, at Dysis Foundation. And, um, and they were like, you know, I think we want disturbance on some level because we, what happens is if you don't disturb a habitat, you get a late successional community, right? And that stifles diversity too. And so really, I mean, if we want to make this as basic a question as possible, stop tilling, right? Stop disturbing. But the more advanced you get within the system, you realize you need punctuated disturbances. And that maintains a much higher level of diversity. What's the best punctuated disturbances? Livestock hooves. Pigs. Man, get the pigs out there. Holy moly. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing disturbed my farm more than those pigs last year. Yeah. But really important. It totally changed the vegetation community on my farm. You know, it was really an important component of that. And it was fun to watch. Okay, <laughs> and tasty at the end of the night. Um, how does high intensity grazing, so what am I talking about with regenerative ranch or animal production? Um, well, this is also Jacob's work. Uh, so regenerative a animal production or uh, management is high intensity, so lots of animal units out there. Move them frequently, so flash it, move them on and then allow it to rest, okay? And then stop using parasiticides. So those are all regenerative uh, animal production. Okay. Um, the other ones are basically put the animal out there and forget about it for the season and come back and collect it up at the end of the season, okay? Let it graze it, graze it down to a golf course. Um, so we uh, surveyed 16 ranches in eastern South Dakota that ranged from regenerative down to conventional. And then we looked at what was going on on those ranches. So we took these cores and then we did bio inventories. Uh, in this study, uh, we get the whole lab crew going on this, okay? Uh, 116,000 insects were identified. There were um, uh, 400 uh, insects per pack and we got 172 different species from these different ranches. That's just in the terms. Regenerative ranches had significantly higher <laughs> amount of species and diversity, okay? Two different metrics of how those communities are responding. What drives pests? A lack of diversity, all right? This is critical. The more avermectin that they were using in these pats, or the more that we detected in each of these pats, the fewer predators that we were finding in there. That's where your pests come from. You're making your pest problems by using avermectins. Right? You're making your pest problems. They're an addiction. Pests aren't the problem. If you have a pest on your field, or in your pasture, or in your animal, find the problem. Stop slapping band-aids on, okay? Change the way you're managing things. How do you do this in animal production? First off, get off of the drugs. Step one, lots of animals. Move them often. Flash graze these things, mob graze these things. Integrate herds. And this is not something that we are, have done a lot of. This is the frontier, if you ask me. How do you get more than one species grazing in a thin spot at a time? Animals work together. Diversity ha is important on far on cropland, right? Getting lots of different plant species. Diversity is really important in your livestock production. Really important. Okay. Um, that's it. That gets uh, some things to think about. Um, so I would not be here if it was not for farmers, beekeepers, ranchers from all over the world that decided to reach out and support us. Um, wonderful young group of uh, enthusiastic scientists that are uh, really passionate about this. 
Um, we have t-shirts and honey for sale. Um, if you guys, that's honey, it, most people have never tasted real honey. Uh, the honey that you buy at the grocery store is, is, is not honey more often than not. It's, uh, it's actually adulterated rice sugar from India and China that they dump on the U.S. market to drive honey prices down. You have to know your beekeepers if you want real honey. And we have honey that's been uh, produced by a no, a no antibiotics and uh, no, no artificial feeds. So it's made off of the prairie at Blue Dasher. If you want to know more about us, whoa, you have to act fast. There we go. Uh, at dices.bio, you can give your money to the government or you can give it to us. Um, <laughs> we are in 501c3 and then Blue Dasher Farm. Ecdysis means shedding the old skin, metamorphosis, so it seemed appropriate. Blue Dashers are a dragonfly. Uh, if you have dragonflies on your farm, you're doing something right. Okay, that's a really important indicator of environmental health and also a good predator. So we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, look us up. And um, with that, um, I think, do we have some time? Okay, let's do that.